So uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, like Jan said, <coughs> my name is uh, Aaron Parasol. I'm from Giga Spaces. I'm uh, the product manager of uh, Cloudify Cosmo, a project that I'll speak about today. And uh, as he said, we couldn't make it. Uh, so he's much uh, better speaker than I am, but uh, you're stuck with me, so <laughs> bad luck. Um, so I'm going to do a, a tiny spoiler here now and tell you what this talk is all about, um, what are the critical points in this talk. So actually, the reason why I'm here is because I think that uh, workflows and uh, workflow engines make a critical component and critical part in uh, automating applications and uh, automating your uh, DevOps operation over the cloud. Um, and also, I would talk about uh, Amazon Opsworks a bit, uh, and I would claim that we're missing something like Opsworks in OpenStack and see uh, how it can fit in OpenStack. What are the, the, the projects where it can fit in or where it should fit in and how it should be built. So that's, that's the talk today. And, and we'll start with, uh, with a use case. So uh, we're talking about a very serious and big uh, SaaS company, Meet uh, Petsy. They're supporting uh, uh, pet artists uh, since uh, 2013, and uh, they're doing uh, great business over OpenStack. So um, all of their operation, all of their production and testing and everything is done on OpenStack. They have uh, quite an impressive uh, stack here. They have, uh, of course, their web front with uh, the Nginx and the Unicorn and Postgres and all of that. And then they need to ship uh, a lot of information into the analytics uh, part with the Hadoop and the Mongo. And of course, they have all those tools that everybody needs in, in production, such as uh, Nagios and Graphite and Logstash, and even the Jenkins for uh, continuous integration that they hopefully one day they, they get it up and running. So um, their business is doing great, uh, especially those uh, cat art uh, products. But rolling out new code is painful. They, they have a lot of problem because um, every time a node crashes, the MTTR is not that great. Uh, they couldn't uh, really uh, do any kind of serious uh, integration testing. They don't have continuous uh, deployment. And uh, they're looking to improve because they can't keep their uh, margin. They can't keep their uh, customers satisfied with that. So uh, obviously they need to automate and uh, they would like to automate everything and uh, in this session we'll try to help them to figure out what's the right way to, to automate. So um, we'll have a closer look at uh, DevOps processes. I'm going to uh, go through most of the well-known processes that uh, one would need to have in order to have a SaaS operation or any kind of uh, production operation on the cloud. And I would claim that uh, it's all about workflows and triggers. And uh, let me explain a little bit what I, what I mean by workflows and triggers. So workflows seems quite trivial. Um, everybody knows what a workflow is, what a workflow engine is. Uh, we'll see that uh, many of the operations, many of the processes that we, we encounter when we try to deploy an application to scale, et cetera, they are uh, actually composed out of very complex steps that needs, uh, that has many dependencies, has uh, delicate timings, and all sorts of stuff that requires a workflow. So that's why I claim that workflow is very, very uh, critical, and we'll see that. And the other bit is triggers. So um, some operations can be triggered manually, and that's fine, but uh, we also need some other kind of triggers because if you want to be really automated, there are many things that needs to be triggered according to events that are part of either a simple scheduler or in more, uh, in, in many other cases, uh, something that we will call a policy, something that can uh, check a set of rules, check your monitoring, for example, check other conditions and, and get a decision to invoke something and that something would be a workflow. So if we have a combination of um, triggers and workflows, 
I would claim that we can automate everything in a much better way and uh, let's, let's have a look. So um, the first thing would be deployment. So, okay, not every day you need to set up a new environment from scratch in production. It happens more rare. Uh, for example, if you're starting a new data center, if you're upgrading your cloud, uh, you're starting a new business, yes. But how about uh, continuous integration? Uh, one way to do efficient continuous integration would be to automatically set up an environment from scratch, test, and then uh, tear it down. So uh, the automated deployment is probably the most basic and most complex process that uh, we need to, to have automated before we can uh, go further. So uh, what about um, automated deployment? So we talked already about the trigger. The trigger would be uh, either a manual uh, triggering or a continuous integration uh, server such as Jenkins. How about the flow? So the flow is composed of uh, what we uh, often call the three, three layers cake. So we have the IaaS, we have the different uh, cloud uh, components, whether it's the network, the storage, um, the virtual machines, they all need to be created. They also have dependencies, so the VMs are dependent on the network, sometimes they are dependent on the storage. Um, so we need to, to time uh, the creation of these objects. Then we have the, the middle layer, we have the, the middleware, the different uh, servers, the different containers, the web servers, the application servers, the database servers, etc. Again, uh, they have dependencies between themselves, they have dependencies with the network, with the, with, with the VMs, with the storage. So um, there's a lot of interdependencies. And then finally, we have the application artifacts that again have dependencies, they need to uh, reside within those containers and often they need to uh, configure dynamic uh, connections between uh, different components and sometimes they also uh, have some part in tweaking uh, the middleware and with tweaking the, the infrastructure as a service. So we need a step of, uh, uh, we need a chain of steps that sometimes can happen in parallel, sometimes can happen, in, must happen in sequence and there are different checks uh, uh, across the way that we need to perform in order to know that something actually started and we can uh, uh, invoke the next step in the, in the chain, et cetera. Um, going further to infrastructure upgrade, uh, that happens a lot. That can be a security patch in the OS, that can be uh, upgrade to your, uh, uh, any kind of your container version, et cetera, again, uh, now we're talking about something that has to be done gradually. You don't want to have a uh, downtime. So now we, uh, we, don't, we, we have similar kind of uh, process, similar kind of workflow, but in the middle we need to, uh, to act uh, based on triggers. We need to install one node, then pause, see that it's actually working, and then add another node, and if not, we need, to, we need a way to roll back so it becomes more complex. And then uh, going to continuous uh, uh, delivery, continuous deployment, that's even uh, uh, more demanding. So now again, we need to, to push code. Many times we have to tweak uh, the other layers. Uh, again, we need to uh, apply different uh, policies in order to make sure that we're doing it the right way. If we're talking about, uh, about red-black deployment, we're already going back to the uh, first process that we've seen, that it's a whole uh, environment setup. So again, we're talking about uh, many steps and a complex uh, process. Um, and node failure. Node failure is something that happens and uh, in the cloud, the right way to uh, remediate a node failure is uh, self-healing, automatic healing. So again, we need a policy that would detect node failure, that would know that we actually have a node failure. It doesn't have to be a whole VM crashing. It can be uh, a part of our uh, stack that doesn't function well. And in that case, remediation means uh, setting up a new node, but again, uh, doing all the, the entire set of dynamic configuration, going through the entire uh, graph of dependencies, making sure that everything is, is uh, reconfigured. Sometimes we need restarts. So again, a, a workflow process. And scaling is basically similar, uh, very similar to, 
remediation, very similar to auto healing, just uh, maybe a different policy, a, a different trigger. Um, and uh, again, we're talking about uh, some complex uh, flows. So um, to sum it up, uh, what we actually see is that the three-layer cake is not something that we can silo. It's not something that we can uh, install. We install the infrastructure uh, and then uh, somehow put the, the, the second layer on top and then push code into that. That's uh, too naive of a model because we see all of those dependencies where the um, uh, different containers have uh, connections between them and have configuration dependencies. They are all dependent on the uh, network and the load balancer and the storage. Uh, the application components needs to tweak those layers as well. So uh, basically, uh, to boil it down, we need uh, something that will help us to uh, tweak the entire, the entire uh, set of uh, components to arrange everything in a way that would be a smooth process, that would be a reliable process. Uh, we need some kind of a workflow. <coughs> so um, I'll do what we usually do. I'll, I'll go and uh, look at Amazon. Um, Amazon should, uh, I think, serve always as, as a benchmark and also as something that we want to be better, better than. So uh, let's look at how uh, DevOps automation is done on, on Amazon Web Services. Um, so if we look at uh, Amazon Web Services, we can see uh, two sets of, uh, of uh, ways to automate your DevOps. Um, the first pass uh, is this one, do it yourself. I think this is the, the path that most uh, businesses, large businesses took so far. Uh, and especially in, in, I think, in the lack of other uh, frameworks. So starting from the, the most uh, simple one <coughs> with uh, the most work for the user, you just consume the different uh, APIs of the cloud and then you uh, complete that with other tools like uh, configuration management tools. And then you need to do everything yourself. You need to write your own scripts that orchestrate everything. Uh, you need to combine that with your monitoring tools. So as good as you can uh, code and as much resources you can put in there, the do-it-yourself uh, would take you um, the far, uh, as far as you, you invest in that. Um, but that, of course, means you do it uh, yourself. There's no framework. Then you can uh, take it a bit further, sorry, <coughs> take it a bit further and um, use cloud formation. So cloud formation, uh, for those who are not familiar with that, I guess everybody is familiar with that. Uh, it's a templating uh, framework that uh, basically orchestrate the creation in, uh, of uh, your uh, IaaS components. So you can create several VMs uh, you can uh, bind storage to them. Um, in Amazon, you can also uh, do some networking, uh, basic networking uh, uh, components and add them to the, add your VMs to the network. So uh, again, that's only touching, uh, touching basically your uh, ES layer, um, but uh, it's better than just using the API with your scripts. And then uh, you have uh, the higher level services. It gives you uh, a bit more convenience. And so in that area, we see uh, basically two different uh, approaches. First approach is uh, the PaaS approach. Uh, Amazon doesn't call Beanstalk a PaaS, but uh, I think for all purposes, it's a PaaS layer. It's a simple PaaS layer. It uh, will help you to uh, very quickly push code uh, web applications into Amazon. Um, but uh, for you, it's a black box. All you can do is to push code. If that code fits in what they provide to you, the container they provide to you, then you're done. But for uh, serious customers like uh, Petsy, we need something um, with a much wider and much varied stack. So we need something like Amazon Opsworks, 
uh, we need a DevOps automation. So if we look at uh, OpenStack equivalents, how that uh, looks. Uh, so in the do-it-yourself uh, part, it's very easy. Um, OpenStack would offer any, almost any API that uh, Amazon Web Services offer. So whether it's Nova, Cinder, Neutron, Silometer for monitoring, everything is, is there. And as we heard today in the, in the keynotes, and all this uh, wonderful event, there are a lot of developers working to make it uh, uh, even better. So uh, in that front, we're covered. Um, and there, then there's HIT. So when HIT was founded, uh, the goal was very simple, straightforward, to take, uh, to grab away Amazon uh, users. And Amazon users had the uh, cloud formation, so we had to come up with uh, something similar. So basically, it uh, took over the, the exact syntax, the exact templating system, uh, almost the exact API, and just uh, build the, the copycat on, uh, um, on the OpenStack. Excuse me for a second. <coughs> and uh, now, um, with regards to paths, so uh, there's OpenShift uh, by uh, Pivotal Labs, uh, sorry, by Red Hat, and Cloud Foundry by uh, Pivotal Labs. And now there's a, a new kid on the block. We're very excited about uh, this new project, Solom. So uh, I think Adrian is here. So if anyone is interested in uh, talking, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, So guys, uh, this, is the, this is the guy for you if you're interested in Solom. We are very interested in Solom, very excited uh, um, that it's coming. And, um, sorry? And uh, the OpsWorks piece is missing. Um, and I think that uh, we need something like OpsWorks in, uh, in OpenStack. We need something that will allow us to uh, automate all the DevOps uh, processes and uh, help us to cope with those complexities of the three layers that I just showed. So um, let's look a little bit closer at, at OpenStack. OpenStack, uh, uh, OpsWorks, sorry. OpsWorks uh, model is uh, it's quite simple. There is a stack. It represents the, the different tiers of, uh, of your application, so basically the, the topology. Uh, so <coughs> in each tier, you can uh, put uh, the cloud uh, comp resources that you want, and you can assign the, the application stack that you need there. And then you can uh, deploy it, and you can define the scale groups uh, to scale it. Um, so this is basically uh, a good starting point. But I think we can do better because it's still too rigid. It's still too uh, limiting in the sense that uh, there is a close state machine. There is a close set of, of uh, stages that you have to uh, use. And if you need other processes or if you need your process goes, uh, go in a, different, in a different manner, you cannot do that with, uh, with OpsWorks. So we're actually suggesting that uh, OpenStack needs something that is, uh, let's say, OpsWorks++. Plus plus. And um, the main differences that we see, or the main goals that we, we would like to set is, uh, first of all, integrate with HIT. We have HIT uh, to orchestrate the infrastructure as a service components, so why not using it? It's a great shortcut, it's a great tool. And then we would like also to support uh, uh, cross clouds because uh, we're big OpenStack fans, but users don't want to get locked into any kind of cloud. So our um, orchestration, our DevOps tool should work across clouds, should allow users to move freely from different OpenStack, private and public uh, installations uh, between uh, different clouds and even between bare metal and, and the cloud. Um, custom workflows is, is probably 
uh, the most important uh, requirement as, as I mentioned, um, different organization will have different needs with regard to the workflows and there will always be new processes that, uh, that you want to support. So having a custom uh, workflow in the framework is, is key and uh, that requires basically a workflow engine and some additional uh, considerations. Um, again, uh, Opsworks limit you to a specific tool. They use some flavor of chef, not even the, the enterprise chef. Um, different users, different developers have different uh, uh, preferences of tools and also one tool doesn't fit for all the uh, tasks that needs to be performed during the installation. So we want a framework that can actually be pluggable, can play with, with many different tools. Um, finally, we want the monitoring and the policies to be open because uh, monitoring is basically one of the most important uh, inputs for policies and policies needs to be any set of rules because the business uh, thinking of triggering an event is very different between one business and another, between one application and another. So uh, keeping a, a policy engine, allowing you to set any set of rules as a policy and as many policies as you want is very uh, critical again to support all those different workflows. So um, how do we build this uh, workflow piece? So uh, I'm going to introduce you uh, to Cloudify Cosmo project. It's something we started uh, uh, around a year ago. Um, it's an open source, it's 100% open source project. Uh, I'm going to show the architecture and the concepts. Uh, Cosmo is uh, going to be uh, released around uh, Q1 2014 and today I'll show you uh, some demo and uh, everybody is welcome to fork this demo on GitHub and try it or come later to our booth and speak with us about the, the demo. Um, so uh, Cosmo, uh, as the title of this uh, presentation uh, indicates, Cosmo was uh, pretty much inspired by uh, Oasis Tosca. So Oasis Tosca is an uh, evolving standard for orchestrating applications on the cloud. Um, we don't strictly adhere to Tosca. We're just mainly inspired by Tosca concepts. Uh, we really like the way of thinking. We think that uh, when it goes to implementation details, they might be too verbose. Uh, we don't like XML and so on. But uh, the basic concepts are there and uh, we uh, really want to adopt them. So there are three uh, main building blocks. The first one would be the application topologies. So <coughs> a topology is uh, exactly what you think about. It's a, a set of components and the infrastructure that compose your application and how it's uh, arranged, what are the dependencies and I'll talk about that in details in, in the next slide. Then there's the workflows that we, we talked about and the policies that I also uh, described. So uh, let's look at uh, more, more details. So application topologies, uh, they are composed of nodes and relationships. So uh, nodes are the, the different parts uh, of those three uh, layer cakes. So, it can be uh, all the infrastructure as a service components, the host, the network, the load balancer, uh, the security groups, all of that needs to be uh, uh, provisioned and arranged in a certain model. Then there's uh, the middleware components, the web servers, the application servers, the uh, databases and so on. And finally, uh, the application uh, artifacts themselves, the, the database schema, the application code, Sometimes uh, there is more than one model, uh, <coughs> uh, sorry, what, more than one module. And so again, uh, the, the third layer in the cake, it's also a node. Um, the nodes define actions. Actions uh, are the operations, the different operations that you can invoke on each node. For example, install, start, stop, upgrade, uh, scale. Each uh, of these operations is abstract and then you can uh, tie it into something that will actually execute it. And we call it a plugin. The plugin can be anything. It can be 
Ansible, it can be Chef, it can be Puppet, it can be a shell script, it can be Python, it can be uh, OpenStack SDK, it can, it's of course Heat, uh, and so on and so forth. So you can mix and match the tools that you want through uh, declaring the plugins that you want to use for each action on each node uh, when you create a, a, a template. Then you have the relationship. The relationships are really critical because uh, at the end of the day, to have a working uh, topology on a cloud, you need dynamic configuration. So you need a uh, relationship to be implemented on the fly. So again, you need the actions to actually configure the relationship and you need to share uh, metadata and runtime data using the requirements and capabilities. Uh, requirements and capabilities are the counterparts. So requirements are the metadata uh, that uh, no declare what it needs, for example, how much uh, hardware it needs or what kind of uh, connections it needs. And then the cap capabilities is the, for example, the Postgres database during runtime, it will declare, okay, I'm a Postgres database, I'm capable of providing connections on this port and this IP. So when the workflow uh, works, it will actually uh, act on the nodes by the order by the types of the relationship and by the order of relationships. And then you can ensure that your nodes are created in a way that is really functional. And uh, each node, when it's created, when it's started, it, uh, yeah, it has all the dependencies it needs in place. And so the workflow describes exactly which steps you take um, on each node and in which order. Some things can happen in parallel, some things, like I said, needs to be timed accordingly. Uh, the workflow engine will actually uh, read, the, read the, the different metadata from the different nodes and create tasks using the plugins that will execute, uh, execute uh, the workflow. And the last bit is policies. Policies can be used by a workflow, for example, to make sure that the node is uh, actually started correctly and is functioning, is available. It can also be used later to trigger other processes after the deployment has been done. Uh, for example, uh, decide that you need to scale, that you need to auto heal, etc. <clears throat> so how did we build it in practice? So uh, this is a, a sketch of the architecture. Uh, what you can see here is that the user can push, right now the user can push a DSL, a template, uh, written in YAML that describe the workflow and the topology and the policies. Uh, later, you will be able to do that from uh, GUI and you don't even need to know how the DSL looks like. So once you push the, the template or the blueprint as we call it, uh, it's being uh, parsed and split into, into the metadata the different nodes, the topology, all the topology information, and then the workflow engine has the different workflows, and then you can start executing any of the DevOps uh, process that you want to execute. So for example, you can start by installing. So the workflow engine will uh, traverse the different uh, tasks in the, in the different steps in the workflow. It will read the metadata. It will uh, figure out which node needs which plugin and which uh, properties, and it will create a task over the task worker. By the way, we're using here a uh, celery with uh, uh, rabbit and queue. Um, and then uh, you have agents. The agents uh, can consume the task. So for example, here we can have a heat agent that has a heat plugin, and it can actually create the different parts of the infrastructure that we need. Uh, in the same manner, we can do it uh, on any other cloud using either CloudFormation or uh, Boto or whatever. And then we also have agents that are being installed as part of the workflow on the application virtual machines and they also can install <coughs> whatever uh, plugins they need like Chef or Puppet or Ansible or Salt and uh, actually uh, execute uh, the creation and the configuration of the different nodes. Uh, finally, we need uh, the policies, so we need uh, some metric collectors. Doesn't necessarily need to be um, something we ship out of the box. It can be anything you, you choose, and again, 
uh, install the collectors as part of the workflow. You can also uh, report to the policy engine uh, from uh, log stash or any kind of other tool that you, you want. Finally, the policy engine is a CP. We're actually using a Riemann. And uh, the policy engine has a set of rules written in closure uh, that can uh, get decision, make decision uh, around the different stream of events that it gets from your application, including schedules, and then trigger events. Those events would be either events that you want to consume directly through third-party systems or as a, a user, or in most cases, it, it can trigger a workflow. So if we combine it all together, I can install an application. Once the application is up and running, I can uh, add policies to check the performance and availability. And if I'm losing availability or if I'm losing performance, there's a policy triggered, and the policy would uh, actually trigger a, another workflow to remediate uh, the condition. Um, so basically, this is the architecture. Any, any questions about the architecture? Yes. Yes, yes, uh, so I'm going to give a, a demo next. Uh, so, <clears throat> and by the way, all the materials of the demo are online. I'll, I'll give the uh, a, a URL soon. So, um, the live demo that I'm going to show is uh, uh, installing Mezzanine. Mezzanine is a Python uh, CMS uh, application. And uh, the steps are as follows. Uh, create the VMs. There are two VMs in this case, one for the front-end stack and the other one for the database. I'm going to install Postgres on the back-end uh, VM. Install a unicorn, uh, which is uh, like an application server that runs the Django application. Then I'm going to install, sorry, install Nginx, um, which is the, in this case, it can be the load balancer. It also serves the static content. Then I'm creating the database on the Postgres for the application, pushing the application uh, into the containers, uh, configuring the connections, <coughs> configuring the, the Nginx uh, routing rules, and finally starting the components in the right order. Um, so let's have a look at the demo. Sorry for that, just a second. Anyway, uh, we, we have a partial look and then later uh, you can see it online. So um, what you can see here is a, a network. In this case, I also define a network in the, in the uh, blueprint. Then there's the web server host. And inside you can see the Nginx, the unicorn, and the, the mezzanine app. In a, in a similar way, I am going to uh, present uh, um, the uh, runtime and the progress later. Uh, once we implement that. So right now you can see how the, the tool knows how to model in a GUI um, the, the blueprint. And then, if you look here, you can see that uh, using Kibana, I can already trace um, events that indicates the progress from the, from the workflow and from the different plugins that, uh, that are being uh, uh, installed in the application. Kibana is a log stash, uh, log stash is a log collection tool, and Kibana is a, a web uh, UI for that, uh, for log stash. So right now we still didn't implement uh, a GUI that collects the, the events and present in a, in a, 
more, uh, let's say, user-friendly way. So we're using Kibana, which is quite easy. The, the events are in JSON. Kibana knows how to enrich them and how to uh, organize them uh, for reports. You can query, you can sort, all of that kind of thing. So right now, we just, uh, we're using Kibana just to give indication on how well the, and what's the progress of the, of the installation. And finally, you, you can see the application. It's all, by the way, it's all on HP, HP Cloud, so you, <coughs> you can see the application up and running here. And uh, if you want, you can actually add blog posts, etc. It's working. So um, that's the demo, and let me go back to the presentation. So um, the DSL and all the, the different parts can be found uh, in the Cosmo Mezzanine example that actually uses the Cosmo Manager, which is the infrastructure. You can, uh, you can get that on uh, GitHub. It's also included in, the, in this presentation that later will be uh, available online on SlideShare and uh, on the conference website. Uh, so looking a little bit uh, into, into the near future, like I said, we're going to implement a full uh, whole-blown whole uh, web UI that will allow you to run any of your workflows, design your uh, blueprints, and also trace the, the progress and the runtime, including uh, uh, collecting metrics and uh, uh, monitoring and getting different reports on those metrics. And uh, how do we see that fit into the, into the OpenStack ecosystem? That's probably the most important question here today. So uh, we see this need already identified by OpenStack uh, community. There was a call for a Tosca-like DSL a long time ago. It wasn't implemented yet. Um, we're excited about the, the Solum project. We think it's a, it's a good place to uh, to bring this uh, kind of workflow engine into. Uh, we see similar ideas in the Solemn blueprints. We see the need for a cross-cloud. We see a need for support for continuous uh, deployments and uh, delivery. And as of last week, we have joined Solum and uh, we're here to engage with the Solum developers and uh, the Solum leads. And hopefully we'll be uh, will be able to contribute the relevant parts in, into Solom. And uh, with that, I conclude. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to this uh, presentation. You can meet us in booth C27 in the exhibition uh, area. Also, we'll be giving some other panels and talks. And uh, you can, uh, you're most welcome to try Cosmo and, uh, and uh, uh, follow Cosmo on the on GitHub. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. So can you repeat? Sure. Yeah. My question was: um, How could you please explain the integration with it that you are planning to have with Tosca? Because Looking at the workflows, looking at the diagram you, you showed us, it seems that most of the parts are already in it. So m maybe it's unclear for me, but could you please clarif clarify this, this point and, 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 and maybe tell us the added value, of, uh, not exactly the added value, but what needs to be done at the moment? Sure. So uh, thank you for the question. Um, the way we see HIT, I think that HIT is already uh, providing good uh, orchestration at the infrastructure as a service uh, level. So um, in case uh, our users don't want to uh, bother with creating plugins for the different uh, uh, OpenStack uh, APIs, and they want uh, something uh, that uh, already provide this kind of uh, service, they can create uh, the lower level uh, with using a hit, by using a hit plugin that we will provide, and just adding a hit template for into this uh, into that plugin as part of creating the 
the entire application. Yes, I think. Uh, okay. So this could be related also to the question about heat. Um, in the use cases you listed earlier about like um, updation or patching and stuff like that, that makes a case for workflow, I agree. So I would like to understand um, when you actually want to reason about those workflows, you would make use of the dependencies that are described in the model, right, in the application. And um, how, how do you, like, where is that dependence is there? Like, for instance, um, this web server needs this database server to be up, or there is some software in this that needs configuration from other component. So it looks like those kind of things fit very uh, well in the node description, and I would like to know like how you see that being used in the workflow and where does it fit in your case? Okay, uh, I hope I understood the question. If not, uh, please correct me. So uh, um, if I understood correctly, you're asking uh, how do I model the, the different uh, uh, connections between the nodes and how the workflow acts on that? Yeah, okay, so um, go few slides back. Oh, sorry. Just a second. So um, the topology is uh, made out of nodes and relationships. The relationships describe uh, describes these, and then when the workflow, uh, for the example, for example, when the install workflow uh, goes, it iterates through the nodes. It finds the it finds the dependencies, and then it times the creation uh, based on those dependencies. So, for example, uh, in the relationship, you you and uh, describe whether this relationship needs to be materialized before the, the, the target, uh, sorry, the source node uh, starts or after. So for example, you have a, a database which is the target node and you have an application server which is the source node. Uh, in some cases, the connection needs to be configured uh, after the target had been created but before uh, the source had been started or in, in other cases, after the source had been started, for example, if you configure a WebSphere application server, it needs to be done after the WebSphere has started. So all of that is modeled in the relationship, and the, the workflow understands the semantics of the relationship. The relationship also declares the actions to actually materialize the, the relationship. So the workflow just traverses the different uh, nodes, finds the relationships, and according to that, uh, it executes. Now, uh, we have a star detection policy for each node that you can declare, and the workflow will actually wait for that policy to declare uh, the node active. So, for example, it won't start uh, materializing the relationship uh, for a node that uh, wasn't yet indicated to be started. That is, th is that answering the question? Partially, I'll talk to you more. About okay, that. you're most yeah. welcome. More questions? Yes, please. Yeah, you said that you use, uh, I'm, I'm a member of Tosca, so you said that you use Tosca-like um, uh, templates. Uh, why did you depart from Tosca exactly? You said that you didn't like XML. Uh, is there any other things that you didn't like about the Tosca specifications? And uh, there can be any way to make these templates you have created similar to Tosca or compatible? Uh, okay, thank you for this question. So um, I think that uh, for the most part, we didn't like the XML and some of the verbosity. Uh, we think it wasn't user friendly, although right now we're thinking more about a, a GUI layer above the, above the blueprints. We still think that there are many uh, users that would like to uh, use different tools, different editors to create the, the blueprints and even uh, uh, create blueprints uh, by automated processes. So, um, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the main reason why we uh, uh, departed from Tosca. There were other uh, smaller reasons. One thing that we uh, started doing exactly like Tosca and we didn't uh, like that much was uh, uh, 
um, the interfaces. Uh, at the beginning, we started with the interfaces, and then we thought that uh, the actions needs to be very uh, straightforward on the node. So uh, we we decided to flatten it a little bit, and we're still uh, we're still working on that. However, uh, I think that uh, uh, we can still use a, a Tosca parser and translate it into our model, or if Tosca uh, is willing to. Uh, uh, Cooperate with us and find a, a YAML model. We probably like to stick with Tosca. <laughs> yes, please. Actually, YAML model is upside down. So first, it out for Oh, okay. So that's, so then that's that's great news, and we will be happy to contribute our thoughts and uh, some examples and uh, to collaborate. Any other questions? Any more questions? There is one question here at the end in the front. The end. I was just going to ask, can we see that uh, GitHub URL again, please? Sure. Was there one more up front? Yeah, one more up front. Okay. So uh, you said that uh, Tosca is very uh, similar like uh, DSL. So why you choose Tosca? Uh, why not is DSL? So what's the gap between Tosca and the DSL? Our DSL or? DSL. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah, so I think it is, this is a question I just answered. So uh, we wanted to have something which is not XML and less verbose, and that's why we created our own uh, DSL, and we were using YAML, uh, which is a great tool for that. Uh, we wanted to have something very declarative and very simple. So for, uh, for the, uh, uh, in the terms of the capability for Tosca and the DSL, so what's your opinion between uh, so for DSL and uh, Tosca's capability. So for application description, uh, if DSL can describe uh, the application uh, rightly, so does Tosca can also uh, describe uh, this application right? Tosca can describe, sorry, why? So uh, uh, my point is if, uh, if Tosca can describe uh, the one application uh, in detail, so does DSL can also do the, uh, reach the achieve this target? Yeah. Uh, so right now we we still didn't put uh, capabilities and uh, requirements in place, but in, uh, we're following Tosca in that uh, in the way of thinking. We're just changing the syntax a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't we didn't uh, change any major concepts uh, from Tosca, so uh, we're following Tosca. All right, I think that's all we have time for, so thank you very much, Yaron. Thank you, guys.